right, so um, we're gonna try something now. So, okay, so I had the fortune of speaking to a large number of um, um, young men who were attracted to uh, younger children. And I know a lot of kind of like clinicians and researchers like, oh cool, I wanna do that too. Um, and so we're very lucky today that we've actually got two people um, who are willing to talk. Because it's also very hard to have people talk in very public forums such as this. I mean, this has been live streamed, you know, people can kind of access it. And so I'm gonna introduce you to two people. There is John, these are both pseudonyms. John, who is 24, works in customer service and lives with roommates in the Midwest. And then we have Mark, who is 20, and he's a student who lives with his parents and siblings on the West Coast. Now, they're both young, self-identified, non-offending pedophiles. Um, and they've got very different, but, um, and varied stories, but there are certain similarities and threads that run through their experiences, which will be interesting. Um, and it's kind of, this is kind of hard to set up because they need to remain anonymous for obvious reasons. However, they want to share their experiences with you today. Um, and so I'm going to be asking some very straightforward questions about what their first-hand experience with minor attraction entails and really what they'd like people to know. Um, first, I also want to welcome people who are viewing, uh, are listening, live stream and viewing live stream. Um, and also, once we finish the panel, once I kind of have my go at them, um, we're going to invite you to um, ask your own questions. And I think, how's that going to work again? Index cards, yes, index, index cards, yeah. And so pass them along towards the end, but we'll, we'll let you know when that when that time is ready. So, yeah, so everyone like to everyone to welcome uh, John and Mark. Up, oh, it's here, it's here. Okay, so, uh, okay, so, um, John and Mark, can you both hear me? Have I got them muted? I'm so sorry, I'm so technologically not advanced. Um, oh, I thought that was it, okay. Sorry, John and Mark, now can you hear me? Fantastic, Whew, okay, now we're ready to roll. Um, all right, so um, you both heard that, and again, thank you so much for um, taking the time and being brave enough to, to kind of speak about your experiences. And so again, I'm going to ask you pretty straightforward questions, but I think ones that are very important for people to understand what your experiences have been like and continue to be like. Um, so actually, I'll start with you, John. Um, can you just tell me how you first realized you were attracted to young children? Um, I developed my first crush on a boy that was a year younger than me, um, but who looked considerably younger than that, um, had not gone through puberty. Um, and, and I think it, I might be unique in the sense that from the very beginning, I do remember thinking that this isn't homosexuality, this is, I'm attracted to the youthful features of this person. Um, and and it, was, it was like a normal first crush, like I got all excited any time I saw him in the hallway and it was just, it happened to be someone who looked very young. When did you actually, and again, this is to John Mark, I'll, I'll ask you the same question shortly, but John, when did you realize what this actually meant? That this maybe was like a different experience to other um, young men your age? Well, I guess I, I was pretty confused, uh, obviously. Um, because I had never heard of this. Uh, like you said, pedophiles are middle-aged men who you only hear of because they have committed a crime. And so I didn't really know like, if there was anyone else like me, and I didn't really know what it meant that I had these attractions, what it meant for my future, if I had a future. Um, and, and it was very hard and scary. I, I feel like I did, I, was un I understood what pedophilia was at that age, I had heard of it, um, but I had no idea how one would live with that, 
and, and it was it was very scary. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to stop you there because I want to come back to actually that experience in a minute. But um, now switching to Mark, Mark, could you please tell us um, how you first realised you were attracted to younger children, and and at what age? Yeah. Um, so I guess for me, it also happened uh, around puberty. Um, when I was around 13, 14 as well, I started to realize that uh, all of my fantasies would just kind of gradually move towards uh, boys my age or a little younger, and sometimes really younger. And at the time, I thought it was a little strange, but I didn't quite think it was a big deal. I didn't think it was an actual attraction uh, until I got a little bit older and I realized it wasn't going away and uh, while I was getting older, uh, the people I was attracted to were younger than me now and way younger than me. Just to give us some kind of context, could you kind of roughly describe what this age of attraction was, the brackets for this age you're attracted to? Um, I would say my age of attraction is between 6 and 14. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, it was probably just a couple years younger. Uh, I didn't ever think about boys as young as 6 back then. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to a little bit older and you realized that these uh, children were either staying the same age as you grew older yourself or actually were going reverse and getting younger. How, when did you realize what this meant for you? Um, I was about 16 when I realized that it was more than just a small attraction. I realized uh, I was a pedophile or a map. Um, and it was very confusing. I didn't quite know how to feel about it, but it was it was relieving on one hand because I felt like I knew more about myself uh, and I understood it a little bit more. On the other hand, it, it was so taboo and it, it felt wrong and shameful. Mm -hmm. And did you have any reservation about using the actual word pedophile to describe yourself? Yeah, uh, I guess initially, especially when I was 16, I did have huge reservations about the word. Uh, I guess now I've kind of gotten a little bit more comfortable using it. I kind of think it's straight to the point, and and uh, people understand what you mean. Uh, besides the connotations with uh, acting, uh, which I don't like, but. Well, I also ask that question because I feel like I've had these discussions with many people um, who don't identify as pedophiles, and people are very cautious about the idea of people who are 14, 15, 16 using this word to label themselves um, and basically kind of like self-identifying. Can you speak a little bit about that? Like, is it important for you to identify as a pedophile, or is it just the easiest way to describe it? Um, I guess... Yeah, it is a little important for me to identify as that. Uh, it is, uh, I guess it's complicated though. I'm not sure it's necessary. There are other words I could use or other terms, um, but it, it does kind of explain things and it's straight to the point. I would say that I have also struggled uh, and like not 100% sure about what I'm supposed to call myself over the years. Um, because it's just a little complicated uh, with that word. Um, but more recently, I've become very comfortable with it. Um, it's just, I mean, you kind of just have to pick one, I guess. Uh, and although not everyone understands the difference uh, between uh, a sexual offender and a pedophile, um, you know, I guess our best bet would be to kind of try to explain what the word actually means. Um, but when I first came out, I believe I, I described myself as a boy lover to a friend of mine. Um, which I don't know if that sounds any better. Yeah, of course. Um, now, John, I'd like to ask you the same question. What kind of terminology do you use to describe yourself, and has it always been the same way? It's evolved over the years, I guess. Um, and I remember when I first joined Burpet, 
I think you mentioned earlier, uh, virtuous pedophiles. Um, I did start a thread on there along the lines of something like, can we get a new name for ourselves? Like, <laughs> pedophiles sound so awful, and everyone hates pedophiles. Um, and most people disagreed with me on there. Um, they were like, no, that, you know, this is who we are. Um, people just don't understand the word. Um, and it will be confusing if we try to come up with something new. Um, and so kind of, the more I thought about that, the more I, I kind of agreed um, and have become very comfortable with it. Um, but yeah, originally, like, I, it, it was just a very hard word to say out loud for me. Mm -hmm. uh, especially when I started telling people in my life about it. Um, it's just, it's very hard to get it out. And, and, and you say that you kind of became comfortable with this. Can you tell me what the realization felt like when you first identified as a, um, as a pedophile? I don't remember the exact moment of realization, or if there was one, it was, I'm sure it was somewhat gradual. Um, but it just felt like a dirty secret that, you know, I remember when I was in junior high thinking like, okay, this is, this is something I can't ever speak about and will take to my grave. And that's just how it has to be, because um, you can't change these attractions, and no one's ever going to understand. Uh, so I kind of just shoved it down and tried not to um, let it come out ever. Uh, or very fortunately, more recently, I've, I've let it out. And can you tell me why you decided now to disclose this? And tell me, firstly, who you disclosed this information to, and why you decided to do it now? I couldn't keep it in. Um, the first time I told someone, unfortunately, was it was a little um, persuaded by alcohol, um, <laughs> a little boost to finally get me over the hump there. And it was very hard. There was a lot of sobbing, and just I was beside myself and couldn't believe it. I was finally saying it out loud. Um, and who are you at this stage? Sorry, I, I told a, a very close friend of mine um, who I had known for many years, and. I, it just, I don't know, I, I, it wasn't 100% just like a decision I made, like I'm going to tell someone, in my case, it just like kind of boiled up to the surface and came out, um, and then it, I didn't tell anyone else for, I'd say, about a year and a half, and, and this, when I was, this was when I was 22, I believe, um, so more recently, I've been telling other close friends and um, all of my immediate family members. I think, and Mark, I'm going to get back to you in a second, but I think, John, I think what's really interesting for a lot of people, and especially a lot of people in the room that we're in currently, is that speaking to your family members, because um, I think we discussed many ways in which prevention, how to bring in parents into um, prevention and intervention. So can you tell me what the experience was like coming out to your family as uh, someone who is attracted to small children? Uh, well, my situation was a little unique. Um, I came out to my family because I had decided to check myself into the hospital for some mental health. I was having a really tough time. And there was a family session uh, at the end of this in which um, my father attended. Um, my mother lives on the East Coast, so she's far away from me. Um, and he was very much certain, I believe, that I was going to tell him that I was gay um, when I told him that I had, like, you know, something very important to talk about. And he was surprised when I actually said that I'm, in fact, a pedophile. But he, and I think this is pretty much how all of them have gone. People are, they've been quick to say, okay, I still love you, but they just don't really know what else to say. They, they've never been presented with this before, and want to be supportive, but don't know how, and don't really know how to take this information. Um, but I've found as I've talked to them more, it's, just, it's, it's becoming much easier, and you know, I, I feel like my relationships have been very strengthened by this, I would say, um, this honesty. Um, and you know, I, I know I'm very fortunate that I, I, I think I'm in a unique situation where the people that I am close to happen to be very open-minded. At the same time, and this is due as much as the people in the room, I feel that I was shocked um, that a lot of young guys in your situation who actually have told their family, I assume there'd be a, a lot of rejection, and I think 
I've spoken maybe to like 10 or 12 young men who have disclosures to their families, and I think all but one, the families have been supportive, ultimately, if not immediately. Um, and how about you, Mark? I mean, John described as well, he had some other uh, mental health issues, and I also realized that when people first realize that they're a pedophile or self-identify as a pedophile, a lot of comorbid symptoms bring up. They get very anxious, very depressed. So can you please tell me what it was like when you realized that you, or that you identified as a pedophile specifically? Yeah. Um, so I was about 16. Um, and shortly after I realized, uh, I went through a period of depression and I guess I would say intense anxiety and social anxiety. I stopped talking to some of my friends. I didn't go out as much. I uh, didn't do as well in school. Um, it was a rough time for me. I didn't really know how to handle it, and I didn't really confront it back then either. I just kind of accepted it, uh, but I was still confused, and I didn't really know what to do about it. Uh, it was a rough time. Mm -hmm. And has that kind of feeling abated now, or do you still struggle with it in a, in a very kind of present way? I would say I still struggle with it. Um, things have definitely improved. Uh, over the years, I mean, I build confidence, and my anxiety is definitely better. Uh, I have more friends. I, I have a dog, and I can support myself a little bit, so... Uh, things are better. There are still problems. And have you disclosed this to anybody around you? Yeah. Uh, right now, at this point, I have only told my mother uh, several months ago. I came out to her. Uh, at the time, it was also kind of out of desperation. I was struggling of the, the worst. Uh, it's been since I was about 15, and I just decided that I needed support, and I couldn't keep it a secret anymore. So uh, I sat her down, and I told her I was attracted to young boys. And previously, uh, I should mention, a few months earlier, we had a very positive discussion. Um, she actually brought up uh, the This American Life episode, and she said she'd listened to it. And she thought it was the most fascinating thing. And it was very surprising to me. I'd never talked about pedophilia with my mother before. I didn't know how to even bring it up as an issue or something that I would like to talk about. So she had no idea that this was something I was struggling with. Uh, one quick question, um, really quickly. Are you close with your mother normally? Yeah, I would say we're fairly close. Uh, coming out to her, uh, she's been very accepting and understanding and supportive, and that's definitely strengthened our relationship. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you say that you're you're sure that she didn't know. Have you asked her? I mean, did you think she kind of brought up this program because she may have had some inkling that there was something going on? I don't think so. Um, I think she just thought it was interesting, and she presented it to me in a very organic, uh, very just normal, like, look at this interesting thing I heard about, and I, I had a very positive discussion with her about it, and then that was a huge reason that I felt comfortable coming out to her a few months later. Hmm. All right, and, and is she the only person in your life at the moment who knows? I'm sorry, what was that? Uh, is she the only person in your life at the moment who knows about your attractions? Yeah, she is the only one right now. Uh, I don't have any plans to tell anyone else yet, but uh, I could see it uh, being something I disclose to close friends, uh, maybe other close family members in the future. Cool. I'm actually would like to ask, actually, John, have you ever tried to access therapeutic help before? specifically about this rather than for depression and anxiety? Uh, yes. Uh, well, for, for many years I tried to get help without directly bringing up pedophilia. Just, I didn't feel comfortable bringing it up, and I think 
know, Adam is incredibly brave for being able to do that um, at such a young age. Uh, and it never really worked. I, I mean, it was like, like, you know, you can't really get help without explaining what's wrong. Um, it wasn't until after I got involved with Burped and started talking to other people like myself and got really comfortable talking about it and started coming out to people in my real you know, life that I finally felt comfortable bringing this up to a therapist. Um, and so uh, more recently, I think, I guess just like two months ago, really, it, it hasn't been very long, uh, I've started seeing a therapist that I found uh, who was specifically someone who dealt with issues of sexuality, uh, which I, I thought was a great place to start, someone who would understand that how sexuality works, I didn't, like, you know, decide to be attracted to children. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's been really great. Um, she, you know, she doesn't necessarily have that much experience with this. She did tell me that she has spoken to a couple other men who are attracted to children, uh, but... You know, she doesn't have any formal training. Um, she doesn't know, uh, you know, what to say necessarily. But it's just been great having someone who I can share these thoughts with and, and get some general advice from. Um, and, you know, I, I, I actually saw two different therapists. So I was trying to find, you know, one that I felt comfortable with. And, and I disclosed this to them both on the very first day. And both were very interested. And non-judgmental and open-minded, and I think that's really all we can ask for at this point. Mm-hmm. Were you ever concerned, I mean, obviously you know Adam's story and his first visit to a therapist didn't go down so well. Um, were you ever wary before you kind of disclosed in these sessions that people might feel compelled to report you? And I, I know on paper, mandated reporting means you have to name a potential victim, but I've spoken to many young men who have siblings. Um, for example, and then they're just worried that even if they don't discuss being attracted to them in a sexual way, that a slightly overzealous therapist might feel compelled to uh, report. Was this a concern for you? I I think, well, the the way I looked at it kind of was like I didn't really know. I wasn't sure what they could report or what, you know, I I could potentially get in trouble for. So it was just a lot of uncertainty. Um, But I got to a point where I knew that I needed help and there wasn't anything I could do. Like, I just had to, you know, take a leap of faith and hope that this person would be able to help and, you know, hear me out and not try to get me locked up. Um, But I I also just at that point had had so many positive experiences telling people about this and had developed a confidence in myself that I'm a good person, I have committed no crime here, and I'm just trying to get help, that it became easier to, to tell a therapist I think it also helped me, see, you know, come across as not a threat. Yeah. And, and how about yourself, Mark? I mean, I feel like uh, both you and John have spoken about disclosing this to family members um, and seeking therapy. Um, and, and it's very similar to other young men I've spoken with in that they feel that they do it once they've reached the end of their rope. It's not like they're kind of halfway through this journey and they think, oh, this would be helpful. It's like they're just hanging on and they feel they, and I know suicidal ideation often comes into it, so can you tell me, like, if you had any um, experiences accessing therapeutic help in a formal context, and and why? At this point, I have not, um, but it's something I've been looking into for the past uh, few weeks, or I guess uh, this season. Uh, it, it, it's definitely daunting. Um, can you, can it's, you, it's a horror story. Can you kind of extrapolate a little bit on why it's daunting for yourself? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Can you please expand about why it's a daunting prospect, specifically for you? Um, I guess I would say I think it could be very beneficial uh, to have someone to talk to about it. Uh, but it's, it's complicated when, when it is such a huge secret. Uh, disclosing it to anybody is, is a scary thing. Uh, much less someone with mandatory reporting that could be an issue or uh, in a formal way, it's, it's daunting, I guess. Well, is it, for lack of kind of like formal therapeutic help, have, do you have any experience with the online groups that we've been talking about, such as Virtuous Pedophiles or Adam's Group? Uh, yes, I am a member of uh, Virtuous Pedophiles. Um, and can you explain? 
Oh, sorry, not Felix Ross. Well, we know you, but can you just help explain to us what kind of um, support that gives you um, instead of therapeutic support, in place of therapeutic support, I should say? I guess it would. It's it's a great place to uh, connect with other people who are going through the same thing. Um, you build connections, you can build friendships easily, and you don't have to worry about hiding yourself. Uh, so that's, it's, it's amazing for that. Um, okay, and you've both signaled that you're committed to not offending, not, not offending against children. Um, John, I'll start with you. How can you be sure that you won't slip up? Hmm. Um, I, I'll reflect this by saying, I think that's a, a question a lot of people who don't work in this field, um, are very suspicious of people with minor attraction. They think, you know, if you've offended, obviously you've offended. But even I think they're not willing to support therapy for non-offenders because they're like, why? We should just identify them and lock them up. So how can you be sure you won't slip up? Well, um, it's obviously something I've thought about a great deal. And I think the biggest thing is, I don't know, I guess I was instilled with a sense of morals from my from very early on and you know, I, I grew up in a very happy home and I, I understand how you're supposed to treat other people and so I know that if I ever did anything like that it would really I, don't, I, I wouldn't be able to, to live with that um, so while I, I felt tempted you know in certain situations I thought like you know I could get away with this I always end up coming back to the thought well like you know with that brief release the worth, you know, the agony you're causing in this other person and the agony that you would probably ultimately be feeling in yourself for years to come. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I guess that's really all that I've got is, you know, I don't want to hurt anyone and I, I don't want to feel guilty for the rest of my life. So I, I think it's not worth it. And how about you, Mark? Because I feel this question may be a little bit more pertinent for you, if only because John is seeing two therapists and you at the moment are not, and you're just a kind of using online support groups. Um, how confident are you going forward um, with or without therapeutic help that you may slip, may not slip up? Uh, I guess I would say I'm, I'm pretty confident. Um, I feel much the same way that John does. Uh, I don't think I could live with myself if I did something. And even though I don't have uh, therapeutic support right now, um, I do have my mother as a personal support, I guess. And uh, that also kind of sways me because I know if I ever did something, uh, it would it would ruin my life. It would also ruin the child's life, and it. it it would ruin my relationship with my family and my friends. And it's just, I don't see a situation where it would ever be worth it uh, for me. I don't think I could ever do it. And do you think that entering maybe more of a therapeutic environment would be a benefit to you in helping you refrain from acting on your attractions? Yeah, I, I do think so. Um, it's... it's good to have more, the more support the better, is I guess what I, I would say. And having a professional opinion or someone with formal experience and training, uh, I think would only be beneficial. Could you tell us, okay, so now you're a little bit older, you've kind of been living with this for a number of years now. Can you just kind of tell us what has helped you so far and what more do you think would help going forward? And this is to you initially, Mark, please. I guess uh, <coughs> online support groups have been incredibly helpful for me right now. Uh, uh, groups like Burphead, uh, the people I've met there have all been super amazing. And they've helped with even things like mm, my depression and anxiety. And you build friendships there. Um, going forward, I guess I would like to seek uh, therapeutic help um, and get that extra support uh, and also continue with the support groups that I've been 
participating in online. Thank you. And, and what about you, John? What would you say has helped you so far, and what more do you think would help you going forward? I think, well, I've really only been involved with online support groups for about six months now. Uh, but I, I, I do believe, even in that short amount of time, that it's completely like transformed my, uh, my outlook on you know, my situation. I, I feel a sense of community there like that I'm a part of something that I didn't realize existed and it, it, it really helps um, to know that I'm not alone in this. Uh, so I'm definitely going to keep, you know, talking to people online on, on Burped and, and, you know, talking to the friends that are there because I think that's just by far the best support that I've gotten. Mm -hmm. um, I think most people who dealt with pedophilia their whole lives have felt like they didn't have anyone to talk to who would understand exactly what they were going through. Um, so talking to a therapist is one thing, getting professional advice on how to navigate life, but it's a completely other thing and, and very refreshing to be able to say to someone else, I have to be distracted, and then they you know, completely get it because they've been there. Well, I've just got one more question for both of you because we're running out of time and I really would love the audience to ask some questions. But, um, Mark, I'll start with you. Speaking of the audience, we've got a lot of people within the therapeutic community, the academic community, and the research community in general and policy. What would you like them to know? I mean, I think it's so rare for you to have like an open line like this to people who could potentially make change in this area going forward. Um, what would you like them to know, basically, if you had, you've got the chance to? So what would you say? Um, I guess I would like them to know that it's, it's incredibly difficult. Um, you're constantly hiding a big aspect of yourself uh, for many reasons. And you're conflicted about <laughs> what it means. And you're also worried that people around you might not understand or it might complicate your relationship or ruin your rep reputation if it ever uh, was revealed. Uh, in the media and online, there are no positive or neutral pedophiles. It's always uh, offenders or evil, I guess I would say, characters. Uh, and the constant vilification totally brings you down. It, it doesn't mind case you feel shunned, it's, it's hard to make new friends as well uh, when you're unsure about how they would react if they found out. And then you sometimes feel distance as well when someone close to you opens up and reveals something personal about themselves or something they're struggling with and you feel it's too risky to Tell them about yourself. Tell them what you're really going through. Uh, so it's hard to seek help. Um, finding a therapist, uh, in my case, has not been easy, uh, but it's something I'm going to keep trying to do. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I guess I would just like to convey how difficult it is. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. And now, John, how about you? What would you like this community of people who are working in this field right now to know? Oh, I think just, I, I really have always, I, I think we're off to a great start here. I think the basics of this you have addressed. Um, I would love if all therapists were aware of this and like if your article became mandatory reading. Um, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think the, the, the big thing that we need to avoid is what happened to Adam in that first therapy you know, session. Mm -hmm. I think we really just, an open mind and respect and kindness and understanding are really all that I, I want at this point. I don't know necessarily the best way to treat people like me. I, I, I really don't have an answer there. But just to know that this exists and that it is very, very difficult and, you know, we really need the help. Um, I think that's a great place to start. Um, and just also, I, I don't know, 
being aware of it all, it's not jumping to the conclusion that say, well, you know, you're attracted to someone who's a little younger than you, but you're probably still just gay, you know, don't worry about it, or you're jumping to the conclusion that you're just not comfortable talking to people your own age. Um, because I, I legitimately believe this is a sexual orientation. Cool. Thank you so much. So before we run out of too much time, I know there are people in the audience with questions. So, um, So sit tight, John and Mark, will be one moment. So can you hear us okay uh, over the phone, online? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so our first question is, uh, how should parents respond if their child discloses that they are attracted to children? What should they say and how can they best support their child? Maybe, John, you might better start with this one. I'm sorry, you say John? Oh, no, I think you might be able to start with this one, please. Can you hear, could you hear the question? Um, so the question being, how should parents react and what should they say to a child who expresses these attractions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Okay. Um, I guess... Uh, my parents, I, I can only really draw on that experience and kind of comment on how well it went there. Um, they really clearly wanted to express that they loved and cared about me still, you know, that this didn't change that. And I think that's probably the most important thing um, because uh, I think anyone who has these attractions, that's their biggest fear is that if they close it, they're going to lose the person that they're telling. Um, and that, that's what makes it so hard. Um, so just right away establishing that, you know, this, this doesn't change anything and that we want to be there for you and, you know, we're going to find a way to help. Um, that's really, you know, I think the most important thing. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, did you have something else to add? Yeah, um, I guess I would say the best thing that a parent could do is just offer and demonstrate understanding and support. Um, and maybe even if they aren't uh, well informed about the issue, ask about it, ask about resources or look into it uh, together. But I guess the main thing would be uh, support and understanding. Cool. Thank you. Um, and Mark, rather than answer, I know we've got a lot of questions, so I think we might just try and toggle and alternate between the two of you. So can we have our next question, please? Even though you're both fairly confident that you won't uh, offend against the child, uh, are there practical safeguards you have put into place on a day-to-day -day basis to protect uh, both children and yourself? Cool. This one might be good for you, Mark. Do you, do, could you hear that? Um, I couldn't really quite hear the last part. Uh, so I'll just repeat it real quick. Uh, even though you are both fairly confident that you won't offend against the child, are there practical safeguards you have put into place on a day-to-day -day basis to protect both children and yourself? Um, I guess for me there aren't really any safeguards, but uh, I don't really interact with uh, children I'm attracted to that much. Uh, there are occasions when that happens, and I feel comfortable. I don't feel like I'm going to do anything inappropriate, or I feel I don't feel tempted. Um, general safeguards, I guess, would depend on the on the person. It's 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 hard to make a blanket suggestion. What about for yourself, Mark? Um, for me, I guess <coughs> I tend to avoid being around boys, uh, not because I'm worried that I would do something inappropriate or something like that, but just because it makes me uncomfortable. Uh, so 
I guess that would be one safeguard I've imposed on myself. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, next question. Uh, how has this affected your relationships? And are you able to form sexual relationships with people your own age? And I actually might have to direct that one to Mark again, because I think Mark, you said something really interesting before about how not being able to tell people can distance you from your peers. So if you could take the lead on that question, that would be great. Yeah. Um, so I don't have much sexual experience. Uh, I do have a lot of difficulty, I would say, with it. So I, I am in a relationship, but when it comes to sexuality, it's, it's it's a little alien to me. It's difficult and uh, it's not quite appealing to me. And does your partner know about your attraction to minors? Yes. Uh, not to kind of like jump on other people's questions, but could you just expand about um, how that came about, that conversation? Because I think people in the room might want to hear about that. Uh, well, I guess it's a kind of complicated situation. Um, my partner is also attracted to minors. And how did you meet? We met on uh, Burpad, the online community. Uh, we started talking and gradually developed. We, I guess we hit it off. <laughs> and uh, so our relationship is a pretty unique one. Um, but at the same time, we understand exactly where each other is coming from. And so when it comes to things like sexuality, uh, I think I have a better shot there than with anyone else. All right, thank you. Right. So the next question is, uh, would the attraction itself be more bearable or manageable without the fear of, of punishment or retribution? And John, if you could take this one. Would the attractions be more manageable without the fear of punishment? Is that the question? Right, exactly. Without the sort of anxiety and distress that goes along with it for fear of, of sort of uh, legal um, consequences. Yeah, I, I think a big part of my hopelessness uh, when I was much younger was that I always thought I would either, you know, I wouldn't live very long, or I would either end up, you know, committing suicide or end up in jail for my two future options, um, because just all that I had in my head was that pedophiles get caught and go to jail. Um, so if I had some idea that there was another way, or that, you know, or even that that was not the only way, that would help a lot, and, and I think it would have definitely given me more hope. Um, growing up and, and kind of would have, you know, I would have invested more in my future probably if I thought that there was a way that I could have these attractions and not end up getting in trouble with the law. Um, it would have helped me, you know, talk to therapists a lot sooner, I'm sure. Uh, that was always the main thing that kept me from telling a therapist was I didn't know if it would get me in trouble. Um, uh, yeah, I definitely think you know, if there was some magical way where that was the case, that it, it would have helped a lot. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the next question is, what language or phrases uh, would encourage you to reach out to a therapist? So, for example, how might a therapist advertise themselves so that um, they're approachable and you know that this is something that they can uh, treat effectively? And perhaps, Mark, this would be good for you again, purely because of the fact that you're, at the moment, looking for a suitable therapist. What, like, I think, like, maybe, like, an abridged version is, like, what could therapists do to kind of signal the fact that they're approachable? Yeah. Um, I guess just mentioning uh, offering or willing, being willing to see minor attracted persons uh, would be huge, just mentioning that. Um, I've looked at a lot of therapists, and... I haven't seen one yet that mentions, mentions uh, working with uh, SNAP or pedophiles. Uh, so just that would immediately make me consider them more than others. Um, uh, yeah, 
yeah, I guess that, that's really just a big thing, just bringing it up and making it a point. That actually seems kind of easy. Yeah. Yeah. There you go, real simple. Um, thanks so much, Mark. Um, we just got actually time for one more question, so. So what keeps you hopeful for the future? That is a perfect question to end on. Um, John, could you please answer that? I'm sorry, could you repeat that question? Ah, it was so good. Um, what keeps you hopeful for the future? Um, what makes me hopeful? Um, I would say the fact that we're talking about it now at all makes me very hopeful. I think like I just, once I found out about um, this symposium, I instantly became a little more hopeful that like this was happening is very exciting. And um, I think also, to be honest, when it comes to me personally, um, it, the biggest thing I've always felt is that I, I was going to be alone forever and never have a romantic partner in my life because of these attractions. And uh, I, I'd like to give Mark a lot of credit because, you know, his story does give me some hope as well, like that, you know, there are perhaps orthodox methods of making it work with someone um, and that it's not completely impossible. Um, that, that, is, that goes a long way, I think, in um, making me feel hopeful. Um, I think, yeah, I think we're all headed in the right direction here. Um, and, and so I, I'm feeling much better than I was, say, a year ago. Um, I had no hope at all, and now I've got some. Cool. That's a really, really good point to end on. So um, I'd like everyone in the room to please thank uh, Mark and John, who have been amazing. So thank you so much, guys. Um, I'd also like to thank Adam listening at home because he's been such a pivotal part of this process. And lastly, before I'm wrestled away from the microphone, I would like to again just take the time to thank both Elizabeth and the Moore Center for the Prevention of Child Sexual Abuse. I am tremendously excited about the work they're doing. There are people who are doing fantastic work all over the country, but I think this is like the front runner in the US and in, in the world side, I think. So thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you, Luke, and I also want to say thanks to Mark and John and Adam, and I want to acknowledge um, their moms and their dads uh, for loving them for uh, who they are, and um, I, that's uh, probably the, the best place we could start at for young people like this, and then moving on to therapists. Um, Adam, I will just tell you briefly, um, had to tell me that he wasn't just shy with peers and that's why he was hanging out with younger kids. It's a, it's a very deeply embedded idea um, that a lot of us have to overcome, that these kids really do need our help, uh, and that these attractions, um, for many of them, are not going to go away, and, and they need help and support and acceptance. So um, we are going to take a break, and we're running just a tad late. Let's reconvene at 5 after the hour. Uh, and we'll start right at 5 after the hour with our final speakers. Um, thanks again to our virtual audience and our virtual panelists uh, and Luke. Thanks. <laughs>